slap. Which which won her the 2008 Slapper and Hog Press Prize. Her poems have appeared in many literary journals, among them Prairie Schooner, Sinister Wisdom, Measure, Nimrod, and Crab Orchard Review. Her work has also been included in several anthologies, including This Assignment is So Gay, LBGTQ Poets on the Art of Teaching, Sibling Rivalry Press, 2013, COVID Spring, Granite State Pandemic. <laughs> Hubble Bush Books, 2020. Show Us Your Papers, Main Street Rag, 2020. And Visiting Bob, Poems Inspired by the Life and Work of Bob Dylan, New Rivers Press, 2018. And Nasty Women Poets, An Unapologetic Anthology of Subversive Verse, Lost Horse Press, 2017, among others. She has been awarded residencies at Playa, Gentel, the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center for the Arts, the Vermont Studio, Studio Center, and the Writers' Colony at Derry Hollow. She teaches writing at Plymouth State University in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Welcome, Liz All. Thank you, Mervyn. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Gosh, 2008 was a while ago. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna read, um, I have six poems lined up. Uh, the first one is from uh, my Slapper and Hall Press chat book. Um, and actually uh, in this poem is the, is the phrase that was the original title of my chat book, which wiser people helped me to shed in favor of the title <laughs> that was actually used. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Bully. The eagle is perched on his rock at water's edge for mere moments before the crows come. Black jacketed bad boys, they seem sharpened by the blade bright light of sunrise, painting the channel's high tide and dazzle. Compared to the crows, the eagle's gigantic, but when they start attacking, it's confirmed. He's a juvenile, mottled, scruffy feathered, looking poor and put upon by the sleek crows who dive bomb him all angle. The eagle reminds me of a giant boy, six foot seventh grader, one so accustomed to abuse, fat and shabbily dressed, he has forgotten or not yet realized his sheer size, his talons, his raptor's beak. He could tear a crow in half, but instead ducks away, tries to make himself smaller as the crows aim themselves at him in calculated swoops. He stands his ground for several minutes, but is finally driven from the rock and chased south along the kelp-lipped cobble beach. I'm the stupid human, the one aiming two barrels of binocular from the window, framing a world with ideas about injustice, wanting reasons, taming the wild by twisting its arm into story, tightening the vice of narrative, birthing the big sad boy, muscle bound in metaphor. We all know whose beach this really is. Thanks, Liz. I, I think that your, your headphones might be making noise um, hitting up against something. So I'm not sure if that's what it is, but we're hearing some, some sound. Well, let me try. Is this better without? I hope. <laughs> Thanks for the thumbs up, Spree. All right. Um, second poem, clearer than the first, we hope. Um, this second poem is from my book, uh, which came out in 2000, 2017, uh, which is almost four years ago it came out from Hobble Bush Books. Um, there's, some ling there's some poker lingo in here, but I don't think you need a glossary. I hope you don't need a glossary on this one. Um, this is called In the Poker Room. 
as the player behind me finally, reluctantly, after much chip fondling and card shuffling, after redoing all the math, after asking for a chip count he doesn't need, folds on the river, doubt washing him brow to shoulder in its tepid brine. I wonder, as always, which is worse, playing poorly the great cards you've been dealt or playing them well, exactly and correctly, and losing anyhow to whatever twitches and tricks, whatever noises and intuitions and accidents of a thousand small moves conspire together to plunk luck, like just another hundred dollar chip onto the laden felt. Is it worse for the random universe to conspire against your smarts and certainties? or to see how it was only always you to blame, your dumb tell or your poorly timed bluff, your squandering of the undeserved chance to do this one thing right. Was that a little bit better? Thank you for the nods. Um, so the only reason that I got any writing done toward the end of uh, pandemic year one was due to a group called The Grind, uh, which is an accountability group. You just have to uh, compose a new draft every day. It doesn't have to be any good, but you have to compose it and post it. Uh, and so I have four new poems here um, and uh, I'll cut one if I see that I'm running a little short or a little long on time, but these were all thanks to The Grind and these all are very new. And I'm kind of excited to be reading new poems. <laughs> uh, this is called Before You Wake Up. I wake up. I creak my body out of our bed as quietly as I can, never quiet enough, but today you go back to sleep and forget. I dress. I descend into the church of ritual chores, get the first laundry started, push go on the coffee, plug in, unplug, sort and return various items to their domestic homes. I tend. I fill two plastic jugs with water in advance of the promised windstorm outages, though for now the sun is already burning off the fog and the humidity lingers. I creep out, drive to the farm stand where I tithe in cash to the women who have harvested all I gather into my sack. Ruffled kale, a pewter green if that's possible, a small bunch of thyme, a head of garlic, a bag of tomatoes, six ears of corn, four sunflowers, two cherry scones. I get the trimmed stems into water on the table before you rise and come downstairs and make all the right sounds of surprise and tell me how you never heard me leave. Tell me how you can't believe you didn't hear me leave. <sighs> I've reached a, a certain age. And now my body is surprising me in all new, exciting and interesting ways. It involves uh, a, a lot more medical intervention than I've been used to in the past. Um, this poem uh, responds to that a little bit. This is called The Test. Now you can take it at home. What once was strange and specialist, utterly medicalized, is now yours, regular person, to perform upon yourself, in your house, in your idiosyncratic bathroom, which once maybe housed only a toothbrush, some aspirin and a scale, or even at your kitchen table each morning, some measurement taken where once someone read the portent in your splayed palm or soggy tea leaves. Give your blood or other product of your unruly biology, which you are now permitted to extract with your own hands from your body, to deposit into these containers, to deliver unto these strips, to seal up and mail 
or to feed into a machine, which now too is allowed to live here among the civilian tools and instruments, surveilling interloper among the spatula, the remote control, the teeming motes of human dust. Borrowed. We wake to the end of daylight savings. Now we will only spend it. Spend the daylight down to its raw boned barrel bottom, starting with this morning's first hard frost, shard sparkling on every still surface. The slender nasturtium stem, a volunteer lightly rooted in the succulent we brought indoors, has finally swooned into surrender, starting to tender its green over to the air's dry blade. It will be so dark so suddenly tonight. The darkness will show up early and surprise us. We were given a single hour while we slept and could neither hold nor appreciate nor fill it, not even choose to foolishly or brilliantly squander it. What would you give? to that hour or accept from it? How would you spend or try and save it even though you know the season of saving is over? What would you name such a fistful of minutes? How would it taste given your conscious tongue? We want the new hour, but this one's always borrowed. A loner, we must return every spring when we start the fruitless saving once again, all hours are borrowed, of course, and this one too will be collected. You always have to give it back. I have one more. <laughs> Um, and this is also a very new one. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your kind attention. I'm really looking forward to hearing the other poets read. This is called Gladiola. Luscious spears, butter bloomed, delivered by the beloved. You reach for sky beyond the smudged skylights. Your uppermost tips barely twitching beneath the ceiling fans, stirring breath against cool skin, a kiss so faint the beloved might not fully recognize, sleeping as she is so deeply. Six stems, the bottommost flowers unfurled fully, the upper buds still rolled into tight scrolls, but soon, they'll yawn open, fresh flesh turned up and away from the wilting droop of those below, the earliest, the first tongue lolling petals gone dry and nodding. For the rest of the week, I'll pluck those desiccated ruffles, trim the stems, freshen the water, obedient servant to both the blooming and the dying. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Liz. Really wonderful to um, hear the voices um, behind these poems, behind the the um, chapbook, the chapbooks that won the wonderful prize from Slappering Hall Press. It was great. And congratulations on all your success since the chapbook. I mean, just incredible. You know, you guys have gone on to great things, but the chapbook is always just a great start. And another start, it's a, it's um, the kind of of accomplishment that we return to time and again, right? Because it is a crystal in the middle of all all this other wonderful work. It shines in its own self. Spree McDonald is our second presenter this evening. And Spree, um, you're, you're, you're special because I remember um, writing a blurb for, for your, for your um, chapbook winner. So tonight he's, he will read from his debut full-length collection. I think 
you got to give a person a round of applause for for first book and it's got a great name on it it's called conca baby i got that right yeah yeah conca baby which gourmet nagash professor of english and post colonial literature calls deftly written haunting and enchanting spree lives with his family in albuquerque where he is a high school principal among other past lives he has been a university instructor drywaller building painter high school teacher marina worker tutor fruit packer grocery stocker snow shoveler cherry picker and a teacher trainer in rural south africa he's done it all he's the author of the poetry chapbook milks up codicil from slappering hall press which won the shp chapbook contest mm-hmm. wonderful great to see you spree thank you marvin and thank Thank you, everybody at, at Slapping Hole and everybody here. I always feel like it's like that old Wayne's World movie thing, like I'm not worthy or we're not worthy, we're not worthy. <laughs> and uh, when you uh, agreed to write a blurb for me five years ago or so, Mervin, it was really an honor. I just want to say that uh, in public here. Um, and it continues to give me a lot of just inspiration to go back to that, uh, to, back to that chat book and, and keep working okay. through all the all the ups and downs I think we all encounter as writers and poets and everything. So thank you. Um, I wanted to start with a poem tonight, which is from this book, Conca Baby. And uh, it's an elegy or a dirge for this uh, South African um, jazz musician named Zim Kawana, who passed away about 10 or 12 years ago of a seizure. He had a seizure and he couldn't get adequate medical attention and uh, unfortunately passed away quite young. And um, I'm starting out tonight because it's a two two week anniversary, unfortunately, of one of my sisters passing away uh, after a long battle with cancer. But unfortunately, she struggled like a lot of people right now to receive adequate medical care. Uh, I I see you bed in her final hours, uh, and so I really have come back to this poem um, as a way to sort of channel and process some of those emotions. But nonetheless, um, anyway. So I just want to read it in honor of Zim Kawana and my sister, Allie. Um, the final 38 seconds of Zim Kawana's San song. The album ends this way. It sheds and unsheathes, te- tears up with reed squeak and analog crack. Zim naps off the sides of the melody as he goes. In this soft hour in which the word gives less resistance, I wrap my face in his sudden blue obituary, wavering on the computer screen, a stroke like a broken reed or heat lightning, eight hours on a gurney in Charlotte Manye Macheke Hospital, awaiting the unbreaking of the CAT scan apparatus. In a late interview, Zim said, silence is the shadow of the note said jazz is crawling on broken claws to its ratex death. Said space is the place, but you must expose your head and neck to face the firmament. I lean back and listen to my daughter's footsteps padding down the hallway. She reaches with both gray hands through the emulsified light rising up my chest. Peel it back, Brazim, she implores, peel it back. Just, just, just peel it back like that. So that's, um, yeah, that's a poem I wrote about 10 years ago for Zim Kawana. Um, I wanted to read the title poem from this collection, Conquer Baby. Um, I was driving to school this morning, dropped my kids off, got kids all ages, <laughs> including a little one who's seven. And I saw she left something in the back seat and I picked it up and I saw this piece of paper and on it has her name, and it's the start of a story she must have been working on back there. It says, once there was a fox, a red fox, and after a long time, and then it ends. She didn't go any further than that. <laughs> and I just snatched it up, and I thought, I'm going to hang on to that one. That's a good start to a story, and I want to come back to her with that later. Um, I don't want to lose that one. It's really magical. And I'm reading that because when another daughter of mine who's actually sitting in the next room waiting for 
her dad to get done with another poetry event <laughs> and so we can go home. When she was a little kid, she had a cast of imaginary friends and characters, and they were all fun, except for one character named Conca Baby, who she would never explain. She just would throw out Conca Baby as this sort of trickster, uh, you know, really loaded character um, and, and not going into too many details. Um, and so I thought I really need to explore that character and see where it goes. And so uh, I just thought I was going to write one poem and I wrote a cycle of poems over several years that ended up uh, in Milksop Codicil, which is the chapbook that uh, Cypring Hole Press published, as well as then in this book called Conquer Baby. So I'm just going to read the first Conquer Baby poem. Um, Bruiser of the boardwalks, puppy chucker, crashed plastic trolley. Conca baby dons her suit, bellies through the pumpkin rust sunset in sweet pink skull cap and henchman's red dress. Russell's trash cans along the crumble curb. Conca baby braids and tethers, infibulated in fits, cavern stitched into wing tips, Eusiris born of nighttime eruptions into the fists of Dr. Epilot and his axomite shoulder jig. A fence line erupts into neon Picasso whips. My ghost buggy mare shambles through the abscess of ruins, eyeing the anxious boulevard for you, my loyal shotgun blast, purpling a bruise in the night beside me. A whisper smith alights, nothing but bones to dig ourselves out of this one, she breathes into my cheek, nothing but bones. Here, drink this with your dirty hands, a stone flavored broth. As I nap patella scraps into razors, as I await the space gun's report, as this nag trenches about under the weight of the obelisk eye, my face slowly dilates and absorbs, a fence line, a roadside, a chest like a mudslide. My mouth fills with howl. I'm overtone droning, knuckle suckling. I click this molar rosary as Conca's dirge descends. Scrape a grave in the apple stone, she sighs. This one good horse has slipped its joints. So yeah, I wrote that, I thought it was it. And then the more I thought about this character, Conquer Baby, it just kept circling through a bunch of other poems. And one of those that came up a little bit down the line is titled Colony Collapse Syndrome. Ever since I was a small child, I've been fascinated with bees and, and their lives and how much the social life of bees and sort of ecological life of bees uh, can symbolize other things, including this idea of a colony collapse. Um, and I was so fascinated by bees, apparently, my mom said when I was about two with my sister, Allie, who I mentioned earlier, she came into the bedroom and I was smashing them on a window and eating them. I, I had this real primal relationship with bees going back to that age. Uh, so, somehow they keep sort of weaving their way through my poetry and this is so this poem is called colony collapse syndrome as we squat through slum rise slum set in this laborhood of atlantis i wonder how much sun one needs to see to say she's seen it set this life in the house of bees a simple stock fortified by light oblique as it ends it seems she gathers strength in fading don't just expect to die, she sighs, but know that you'll also be forgotten. These are the stories that dead tell themselves. One night in exile, she made small circles with her heels in the bedsheet. Like a finger over crystal lips, she swirled into, until a slow found center coalesced into a sugar storm, flowed over our hovel at the top of the stairs. So much unwaged labor, boiled off into the wallpaper. She said, it's true. It smelled of boxes in there, soft power and echo chamber music, the semiotics of assault rifles, our shoulders dry rubbed with anesthetic salt rash and technocrats. Now this poorly lit paradise, a Molotov wick soaked in the oily abyss. So many small engines after dark charge hard between the herbicide lines and febrile fight or flight. It seems this coast is the same latitude as my dreams. Duca music, growing, eroding. I'm tired for tomorrow. Okay, a couple more I'm gonna read here. Um, 
I did not set a timer, Mervin. So I, I made I have my timer here and it never set start. But I, I think I've got time for a couple more here. Um, and please cut me off if if I don't. Um, so one one thing I was really trying to work with um, for years is how to channel different voices in my poetry, um, discover new characters. And as sort of an exercise in that, I started writing a lot of found poems and, and centos, especially taking whole lines from different sources and recombining them. And, um, and originally I just engaged in that as just an exercise, just to practice trying to find other voices. Um, and, uh, and they, but some of these centos kind of hung around and, and one or a couple ended up in this book. Um, and this is called The Silences of Bob Kaufman. Um, Bob Kaufman was one of the progenitors, I guess you could say, or founders of the beat movement. He's not as well known, obviously, as Alan's give, Allen Ginsberg or others, but he was quite central to it. He was an African-American man from New Orleans, actually, who had been in the Navy, ended up in, on the West Coast in San Francisco and other places. And he's a really fascinating guy, published a few books. And uh, The Silences of Bob Kaufman is, consists of lines he wrote from from many different poems that are spread out over those three books. And so this is really his voice coming through in, in a sort of remixed kind of way. Um, so the silences of Bob Kaufman. The truth is an empty bowl of rice. Truth is a burning guitar. It takes so much to be nothing. Long green journeys into sounds of death. You get off at 59th Street forever. Eternity has wet sidewalks. All those well-meaning people who gave me obscure books when what I really needed was a good meal. Ordinary people, that is, people whose annihilation is handled on a corporate scale. They have memorized the pimples on your soul. Whether I'm a poet or not, I use $50 worth of air every day. Cool. Dear people, let us eat jazz. So we sat down on our blood-soaked garments and listened to jazz. 1,000 saxophones infiltrate the city. My face is covered with maps of dead nations. The poet nailed to the bone of the world. I love him because his eyes leak. In most cases, a sane hermit will beat a good big man. I think of Chaplin and roll a mental cigarette. You must have been great alive. So that's one of the centos in Conquer Baby. And I wanted to wrap it up by reading a newer poem though. Um, and this is called Chama Wilderness. I moved out to New Mexico a few years ago, and the Chama area is in northern New Mexico. So I go up there on vacation and stuff <laughs> and start fooling around with those concepts and, uh, and in creating characters and, and just trying to work with the landscape and what comes up. And so the Chama Wilderness begins with an um, epigraph by Dogen Zenji, or I took from Dogen Zenji, a 13th century uh, Zen master from Japan, or what's now considered Japan. Um, and, it, and it says, uh, the sincere red heart does not stay either. Bit by bit, it is coming and going. <sighs> Somehow that night turned into a long time ago. A cream colored scarf, hope in the high country, the deep dove of evening. A raw pile of breath dropped down my chin as I strummed Lyle Lovett's tunes and we zipped two sleeping bags together in the dark. Without curtains, the black brook of sleep coursed over oval stones. The sky revolved, cracked someplace, time pouring in. Against the winter's hay bale gray scale, we woke to wash our sour parts in the basin, cutting stream water with kettle steam, toweled off, each other off and dressed with a scream. Over a breakfast fried against the frost, the slow sift of her smile, a loose contusion of desire. The way when she laughed, she shaped a small hearth here between the arches of two soft palms, as if to dedicate each absurdity to eternity. That's all, that's everything I can grasp back from the uneven nap of time, endless days and sudden years between this and then, each moment crumbles open when I clutch for it. With few claims left on this life, on love, on my name in the mouth of another, most days only this remains, the simple dedication of a campfire. May this whole life be my offering 
as the sincere red heart in its simple hearth gives and gives and gives. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Thank you so much, Bree. It's beautiful. Uh, your poems reflect uh, the many varied areas of your life. You've been everywhere and done most things. And I suspect you will keep on doing most things. Thank you. That was great. Um, I remember Bob Kaufman well. I, I remember one of his books, one book, uh, Golden Sardine. I remember that. And I remember a, a short line that I think he said it himself. He said, the world, he disappeared. People had no idea where he'd gone to. And they said, when they asked him, he said, the world wouldn't give me a vacation. So I took one. That was Bob Kaufman. And she, he was just as good, I think, as Ginsburg or any of the other beat poets. But he was just one of those onto himself, you know. But thank you again. Thank you so much. Yeah. What a lineup we have here, the chapbook contest winners, all winners. Our next poet, our next presenter is Lilo Wei, and her poetry collection is Lend Me Your Wings, which is described by Ellen Bass as rich in music and in imagination, a celebration and a joy. It was released July 2021 by Shanti Arts Publishing. Her chapbook, Dubious Moon, which title is just wonderful, Dubious Moon, won the Slappering Hall Press Chapbook Contest. Her poems have won the E.E. E. Cummings Award and a Florida, Florida Review Editor's Prize. Her writing has appeared in New Letters, Poet Lore, Tampa Review, Louisville Review, Poetry East, among others. Way has received grants from the NEA, New York State Council on the Arts, and the Geraldine Dodge Foundation for her choreographic work involving poetry. Her website, www.lilloway.com. You can purchase her new book, I think, this evening here. Welcome, Lillo. Lilo? Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Oh, now. good. I'll start yeah. again. <laughs> Thank you, Merwin, for that lovely introduction. And thanks always to Jennifer, Margot, and Sophia. Uh, I'm honored to be reading with Liz Spree and JQ, beautiful poets all. And I'd just like to thank everyone who is watching or listening. Um, I'll be reading from that book that Merwin just told you about, Lend Me Your Wings, with cover art by Rachel Brummer. And there are six more images of her work inside. I'd like to begin with a very short poem. Its title, Malheur, means misfortune. Um, the metaphor for the speaker in this poem is that of an owl who has eaten a rat that had been poisoned. Malheur. The owl of me swallowed you whole and swift, only later the odd taste. You carried small poison, but enough to serve. I unfurl my wings, hoot, screech, wind roughs my feathers fading gold. The deep gut of me twists. I know what the rat of you has done. Fur and bone pellets fall from my mouth. The fatal liquor remains below. You did to me what others had done to you. I gaze up from my nest. Raptors gather. I think of the next poem as a quadruple ekphrastic. And <laughs> here's the story. Eleanor Wiley wrote a poem called Little Elegy. That's artwork number one. The great composer Ned Roram turned it into a song. That's two. I choreographed a dance to Ned's song. That's three. And now I've written a poem about the dance. 
That's four and brings us full circle. This poem is also about my experience of being with a close friend during the last few weeks of her life. Elegy, a dance. You ask to walk the cedar green path behind your house, to feel the needles of cool air pricking your cheeks one more time. I trail you, watching and ready. You fall backwards as if melting. Your forearms sink against mine until we are elbow in elbow. I step into you and slip my feet under yours. Souls carve over, curve over arches, toes over toes. In this manner, we turn and pick our way to left feet, to right. Your body arches, pitches away from me. I catch it as it crests, steady you into your bird steps. And when they wobble, net you in again. Only now you've begun the dropping. You slump, I grab, hip, ribs. You sink, I lift, clavicle, shoulder. You collapse, I clasp, neck, temple. Down we slide together. You come to rest in my thighs, improbably laughing. Sun is pressing our shadows flat and broad as you go still. A wing slides across your lids. Your eye light narrows, smaller, black, smaller. I never set out to write a love poem, but occasionally after a poem is finished, I realize it is a love poem written slant. At least for tonight, you'll deep those atoms. They'll swirl and settle. Drops on the bloom side of a parasol, a parapluie, a beside sun, beside rain, not against. In bed, I cup my hand around your roundness, cells plumped with fat, but not in this day's tidings with cancer, not this year. When I sprawl over you as you nap on your back, you are my extra firm beauty rest. I am not your blanket. I'm a bobcat scrambling our connective tissue. You say I'm not hurting you, but I know you'll put up with pain to be this close to another animal, skin pretending to be our only barrier. We're going to lie down one day, the way we did today, when we're too tired to go on. Weight of your big head, my neck and cheek your pillow. As you surrender, the container that holds your thoughts drops a millimeter farther into my jugular and jaw. Fear, our dominant emotion, gone. Control, our dominant action, over. What if we'd let go earlier, spent decades lying here in this place, which looks a lot like how we'd imagined it? In your sleep, you smile the perfect smile, one I've never seen before. The epigraph to this poem, entitled Offering, reads, for David S. Buckle, environmentalist and Lambda lawyer, who on April 14th, 2018, self-immolated in Prospect Park, Brooklyn. Come, lion tail, swing yourself, arc, arch, strike the match, it's shocking bloom. Flame-haired, devouring eye, satisfied. Lion-hungry belly, fill with him that you might spare the children. You fire-breathing beasts of despair with all your heads and horns, your long tail scales fray the rope, tip the hope, balance farther, a little farther toward no more. 
The finger symbol rings flawless into the night. Ting, twice more. Funeral flares fling embers into our ears before the final silence, when children's mouths will fill with ash. Unbuckle him, unburn him, unfuel his futile flames, unfossil the fumes, regold them, fold him in our unarmed arms. I'd like to close with a rollicking crazy ass poem called Barn Lit by a Duck Egg. The poem refers to the painter Charles Birchfield and the composer Olivier Messiaen, both of whom were synergists. Um, oh, you'll hear the word guilt, which in this case is spelled G-I-L-T as in gold guilt. And the quote, rocks ox egg, which was stolen from James Joyce's Ulysses. The poem is in five short sections. Barn lit by a duck egg, one. Oh, spheroid, oh, perfect thing. Oh, white in this case, oh, brown in another. Oh, thin shell, transparent prehistoria, transporting splendent from one place to another, from inside to outside where we crouch on these rotting wet boards in the pig reeking dark. From mess to table, rolling light through veins, through skin thin as paper tissue, you issue morning day, fire, I have named you Edison, little Eddie Egg. I don't know what's going on inside there, and I'm not about to crack the only albuminous source in this luminous room smelling of goat and fowl. Two, egg glowing still warm from the heart beating body of your mother, heating my palm while frosting it in duck dung. Egg of lopsided midnight, bottom first you present and will balance if conditions are right. Oh, candling egg. If only I could be as perfect as you, one organic, smooth-skinned beauty with no sticking out appendages, no awk-angled fingers and toes, no nose. I'll roll your luminosity in my palms, switch from right to left, toss you like a juggler, and catch you in my lamp-lit mouth. Three. There's nothing an egg can't be. It bursts a thousand mythologies. It pours out the breaking point, smells like the pouring paste, camouflaging the sulfur until the heat's on and stays on. Little milky knot of attachment. Tomorrow I'll go ahead and eat you or strain you out, then whisk away the sun and its guilt, dilute it with pale reason gobble you down. Four. A child finds a cracked egg, saves it in a shoebox, and swoons her first real swoon when she rediscovers it weeks later at the top of the closet behind Mr. Potato Head medusified. Oh, egg swan song. I slip rocks ox egg between my legs and guide it in, no strings attached, and I'm a lit body, a Keith Herring lamp radiating Birchfield vibrations in creams and sunflower. Listen, music of the night from an egg. Messiaen could see it, and we can too if we lean close, rest the egg in the pinna of our ear, it will sing us until we wake up. 
We'll dance to it and sway our daffy duck tails among the horse tail and lamb's tongue, hold hands with Birchfield's ears and Messiah's eyes, link arms with all the synergists living in secret places where nothing brings on everything and everything happens at once. Five. It's raining on this duck egg now, but not enough to put out its light. Just polish it up, slip wheels under it, and roll it down the line like a new Volkswagen bug still sticky inside from its not birth. Backlit road map of the pointed world. There you see it, the light tracing an unpredictable path, then bursting through, irradiating the barn. <laughs> Thank you. Be well, everyone. Blessings. Well, Lilo, of course you won the E.E. E. Cummings Award. <laughs> and You've brought the art of soliloquy back to poetry. That was just amazing. I couldn't tell if you were reading or reciting from, but I, I won't even ask. It was, it was just wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. That's great. And now the next presenter, um, if I can get his name right, is Jian Ching Zheng. I think I got it, right? He's the author of A Way of Looking from Silverfish Review Press 2021, Enforced Rustication in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, Texas Review Press 2019, Delta Sun, an ebook by Red Moon Press 2018, and The Landscape of the Mind, which was the Slapring Hall Press uh, chapbook winner, editor of six books, including Conversations with Dana Giola and African American Haiku Cultural Visions, both from the University Press of Mississippi. He's also the editor of Valley Voices, a literary review, and his forthcoming book of poetry is The Dog Heirs of Reeducation. Interesting title, The Dog Ears of Reeducation. His poetry has appeared in magazines including the Mississippi Review, Spillway, Poetry East, and Hanging Loose. Welcome, Jian Ting. Thank you, Marvin, for your introduction. You're welcome. Okay. And uh, I also have to thank Margo and Jennifer for bringing me back to the writer center to this reading. And uh, I feel it's an honor to join the other three poets. And uh, I have some poems to read from this book, uh, A Way of Looking. I think uh, I tried to offer uh, a way of looking. Uh, maybe that's my way of looking at things. And all the poems in here are high boom. Uh, they are prose poems, or they can be treated as uh, short shorts or flash stories. Uh, so it's all just like a prose. And uh, the first poem I'm going to read is titled, the River Park in Helena, Arkansas. I've been to this park a dozen times since 1998. I usually go there in late Saturday afternoon and I sit on a bench viewing the riverscape or closing my eyes for a massage of the mind under the sun. It's a small, unnoticeable park behind the dense tall willows with a long elevated boardwalk leading to the river for a view. Old Man River, forgetting the self and the floating world. 
the incessant flow of the river is like a silent piece of blues. Sometimes the slow tooting of a barge sounds like a soft southern drawl. Sometimes the drifting willow catkins add a sense of motion to the still riverscape. Nightfall, the sky unfolds some sparse stars. The casino neon lights start to shine on the other side of the river. At this moment, it's always good to lean on the railing and debout your mind to go from the flow to a world of otherness. Moonrise at the sky's edge, a long sail. Across the bridge and a turn right to drive home down the river road, reflecting on Lao Tzu's words from Tao Te Ching. True goodness is like water. The Mississippi River gives itself to all things. It's truly good and selfless. The second poem is called Diversion. We stay in the Ozark forest for Thanksgiving. There are no lavish dinners since the nearest town is 40 miles away. No eye-catching views since the leaves have fallen and everything looks so dull brown. In fact, there's no nothing except loneliness. Each day we zigzag on the mountain roads taking pictures and each night we see stars and then sleep. Back from her trip, mom writes me about her yard. Weeds, weeds, weeds. The next poem is titled Homecoming. Uh, once I read an article about uh, Chinese building railroads here uh, in the 19th century. When I died, uh, their tombstones all faced the west uh, to miss home. So that encouraged me to write a poem. Homecoming. The man wanders in his hometown where he gets lost one way or the other because the roads are no longer the dirt ones that have remained like sepia pictures in his memory for 150 years. The small river town of Canton is now a metropolitan city with lots of billboards presenting foreign models in fancy fashion. He wanders aimlessly. The trees on the roadside stand like mourners. He feels like being carried back by an ox cart hearse to his father's loud laughter over liquor and the mother's broad smile at his big bite into the pancake she made. To his street fighting and tofu paddling, to his dating and wedding, to his day to son a father and father a son. To his young wife, whom he never saw again after he sailed to America to build railroads, to the poor river where he once swam naked and caught shrimps with a small net and pieces of dry pig skin. He walks down the river, shouting, I'm home, or Hui Lai La. He wants to hear an echo. But his shouting is like a stone thrown into water to produce only silent ripples. He looks hard at the river, his dream river. A horn blows, and then a barge looms in. It chucks along and looms out into the white sun rising over the river's bend. And its horn fades away like a dirge. A rooster's crow headstone of a Chinese railroad builder. The next one is called Home. The King Garden looks like a ghost house after peace went home at 5 p.m. Friday. 
I was always the last one to be picked up. Sitting on a low stool, I looked out desperately. There was no shadow of mom or dad except the bloody sunset on the window. My homeroom teacher became a bit impatient. Why are your parents always late? I parked my lips. An hour later, dad appeared at the door, apologizing for the teacher. You are always late. I poured out my crying tears. Since I was two years old, my parents decided to send me to a boarding kindergarten so they could devote themselves wholeheartedly to their jobs. Each Monday, I begged them to pick me up each afternoon because staying in a kindergarten the whole week made me feel like a homeless child. But they always riddled me with the same words, baby, the kindergarten is good for you. You can hear songs, you can learn many, many good things there. 50 years later, I still wonder what good things they ever learned from my growing up or what good nights they ever enjoyed without me home. Pink Garden Night, the girl holds a doll in her arms. Can I still read a couple more? Fish Debate. One day, Zhuang Zi and Hui Si, two ancient Chinese philosophers, were walking by the river. Zhuang Zi exclaimed when he saw the fish swim toward them. Here come the fish, they look so happy. Hui Si shook his head with an unbelievable look. You are not a fish. How do you know the fish are happy? Zhuang Zi cast a meaningful look and asked, you are not me. How do you know? I do not know the fish are happy. Stunned by the question, Hui Si looked tongue-tied for a good while. To him, man and a fish were two different species, but to Zhuang Zi, man and a fish were one. For the whole universe was oneness. Which came first, the hand or the egg? Endless rain. The last poem is uh, written after a TV commercial about pizza. The title is Actual Toppings. He takes the tombstone cheese pizza out of the oven, slides it onto the plate, cuts out the long arms and legs with a fork and knife, and then puts two half cherry tomatoes for a bra, three slices of Roma tomato for a skirt, one pickle pepper rancinis for the dancing shoe, a mixture of black olives, chopped spinach, and a sliced yellow pepper for a floral head wreath. Now, a belly dancer on the stage, ready to hit rock before his eyes. Separated, they start dating again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jian Cheng. Just goes to show the most ordinary can be the most profound. A, a poem about pizza. I think Jennifer said her daughter would love that. Uh, you can make a poem out of anything. It's a lesson we all need to learn, right? Wonderful. You guys are just incredible. All deserving uh, contest winners. And let me just call the names again, because we, we need to be grateful. And I'm sure Jenny is going to come back on. Thanks to Liz All, Spree McDonald, Lilo Wei, and Zhang Cheng Zeng. Just wonderful poetry this evening. Just great. Thank you.
I'm sure there are a lot of questions people may have for you. The, the chat room is full of all kinds of comments. Let's see if we can. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to try to pin all of the um, the writers um, to the middle of the screen for everyone to see to spotlight them all. Um, okay. Add spotlight. Oh, good, it's working. It's working just as it's supposed to, even without Sophia as the technical genius, but she is here in the audience. Hi, Sophia. Um, okay, now we're gonna spotlight Mervyn too. Okay, and hello. Oh, good, okay, there you go. So um, I guess Mervyn and I are gonna, um, alternate asking questions. We'll see what we have in the chat from everyone. Um, but I think that what we'll do first is we always ask the poets for the students who are here and the students of the Hudson Valley Writers Center to let us know what advice you have for people who are working on their first collections, their, their debut, either a chapbook or a full length collection. What would you say um, to the students who are here tonight and to the students who will be watching this later? What is your most salient advice, do you think? Okay, who's gonna take that first, Liz? Um, I, um, gosh, just, I think I've seen, and I think social media contributes to this a little bit, a lot of worry about the strategizing of the publication and people are on duotroping, like I heard back in four days, I heard back in 10 days, what does it mean? What does it mean? I just, I just feel like, oh, that's so exhausting. Like, yeah. Show, like show up, do your work, be interested in other people's work. <laughs> and I just feel like the rest of it, we can't control. I just recently had my first experience reading many, many manuscripts for a, a book length manuscript contest. And there's just, there's no, <laughs> there's so many, P poets out there writing poetry, which is like, how is that? A, that's a great thing. That's just a great thing. End of story. But looking at that plenty, I think approach it with a sense of abundance, not a sense of scarcity. Like it's not, there's Wonderful. so much that, that I think social media and sort of strategizing makes us imagine we can control for. I'm like, all I can control for, and I can barely control for this, it's like showing up and doing my work. And like being as, as much a learner in that for as long as I can be. So ugh, this must be so unsatisfying to hear from someone who's like, yeah, but tell me the three things I need to do to get my- No, but that's really good to hear that that reinforces what we were talking about today in class, that exact thing, Liz, about how we have to take a break from hearing all that noise on social media. Um, thank you for that. Any, any other thoughts from the others about this exact question? I, I might just add, um, take your time. Don't be in a rush. Um, the longer you wait, the more poems you will have to choose from and draw from for your book. And um, yeah, and then all of a sudden the book is out and you can't do anything more to it and it's done. And there's, there's really no rush. Take your time. Yeah. I would just point out too that you know, building off of the last point, uh, Lilo's point, um, make sure you're very satisfied with the work. And then the point is to create a piece of work that you're proud of. Um, not every editorial team will be as engaged as slapping the whole, whole editorial team. Uh, and you might actually be put in a position of trying to hit the brakes on publishing some stuff that uh, somebody picks up pretty quickly. And so that's a different experience. And so 
um, I just encourage people to really um, submit things they have, you know, a lot of confidence in and, and take your time to get there. Just follow the thread of the, you know, whatever is, 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 is leading you. Just follow that thread until you're satisfied. There's, you know, there's so many poets, so few jobs and <laughs> so few awards. You might as well be putting out stuff that you're really, you know, passionate about. Thank you. Good. My answer would be simple. Uh, read, read, read. Like what the, uh, the other three poets said, read the others, read the you know, good poems. Yeah. I write, write, write. Revise, revise, revise. And then keep sending your work out. And trust yourself. Uh, yeah. Don't just feel disappointed uh, when you get a rejection. Yeah. Keep trying. So I'm not a you know, successful poet. <laughs> so uh, that's all I can say. I, I think uh, I wait until maybe around uh, 20 years since I had a chapbook published by Slavery Hall Press. And of course my job just you know, prevented me from keep writing. So, but keep, but you still have to keep writing, even though 20 years later. And uh, I try different, you know, genres. You know, uh, and that's why I begin to, in the past 10 years, I began to write high boot, a special kind of prose poem. Thank you. Most importantly, I think, um, the idea of finding one's voice, which I hear so distinctly this evening from the between these four four poets, that each one of you you have your own particular voice, you know. And the whole idea, I think, is to that's that's a difficult thing. I see. I remember studying with with Derek Walker, and he pointed that out as probably the most important thing in a poet's career is is to find your own voice, you know, it's, um, it's not an easy thing. And, and how do you know? Well, you know when, when you come upon that voice, you know, as four very distinct people this evening and, and um, all excellent, but all very different from each other. You know, wonderful. I have a question. Um, what, what do you think has, was, has been your, your biggest challenge since the winning the chapbook contest? What do you think has been uh, your toughest fight, so to speak, your biggest challenge, you know? Well, I can uh, respond to that because it's actually connected to where, what, where you just uh, left the last topic, Mervyn. Mm -hmm. It's the sort of anxiety that I might not have another voice beyond what was in my chapbook <laughs> in my first collection. <laughs> and trying to work with that and just figuring it out um uh, and so that's it you know and i've i have started i guess find some other voices but they might still be under that umbrella of the the spree voice <laughs> and, and i'm i got to a place where i'm okay with that and i've written enough now that's you know clearly a different project but that has been the biggest challenge it's a great question thank you yeah, yeah. poetry is, is can be strange right i i, I mean there are days when you know um, you begin to accumulate and you have a, a pile that's kind of growing, and and you on an in, a given day you feel wonderful. You say, "Wow, you know, it's coming along fine," you know, and here they are. And then there will be some Tuesday or Thursday when you just riffle through the first four or five, and you you say, "What what is that?" You know, and you, you can't even stand yourself. You know, you, you say, "Did I do that? What is that?" You know, that's awful. <laughs> but don't tear them up yet because by Monday you will have fresh eyes, right? And, and, and you'll see something else in there, you know? And the wonderful thing, thing about poetry is that one, the shift of one word can make the whole thing fresh and new, right? I'm just kind of pushing you guys. I want you guys to tell me your ideas about, about that, about doubts. Do you ever have doubts?
you don't want to confess to the world. But <laughs> I have doubts every have doubts. with every single poem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And if I do write a poem that I think is pretty good, I have a doubt that I'll ever write another one that's pretty good. <laughs> I like what Lynn just said in the chat, beneath doubts are truths, and that's always good. Mm. Um, I think that th that doubts can, can maybe have the potential to be enabling and not just sort of crippling, like we talk about crippling doubts, which is perhaps not the best way to phrase that, but um, <laughs> dis disabling or somehow like what is the opportunity in our doubting? What are we pausing on? What are we noticing in our in our troubles and our struggles? Um, hmm. I say that like I just deal with all my troubles and struggles so magnanimously, <laughs> which is like this is all very aspirational. <laughs> but that I think Lynn Emanuel said something in a documentary once about like your errors or your mistakes or something that those um, openings, those cracks are where the interesting work is gonna happen in those missteps, in those bad turns. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately and what mistakes I think I'm willing to let myself make. I'm not even sure how to phrase that, like, mm. but yeah, mis mistakes and doubts as, as potentials is kind of interesting to me. To grow from, yeah. Did anyone else want to answer Mervyn's question, which I think is so interesting about the challenges that you've had since okay. the, the chat book? I think uh, my challenge will be to find a way to express something or different expressions. Sometimes when you write one poem after another, you feel like you make hot dogs every day. So you eat the same kind of food you produce mm. the same kind of food. So you don't want to eat hot dogs every day. You want to eat a hot dog today and then maybe burger, you know, next day or maybe Chinese food the third day. So what I mean is uh, you need to find, you know, different ways of expressing yourself in your poems. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of challenge. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I began to write high mood. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote my first haiku in 2003, I think. Mm -hmm. And I waited for eight or nine years again to pick it up. Mm -hmm. It's kind of difficult at the beginning, so challenging. But yeah. right now, it seems okay now. <laughs> but then you have another challenge. After you begin to write so many haiku, you say, oh, what's going on? You begin <laughs> to make more hot dogs again. <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. Okay. Well, we have a question from Marion Brown um, in the chat. Um, hi, Marion. Um, Marion wants to know, um, she said that a lot of you write about music and dance how important is ekphrastic um, poetry to, to each of you? Um, mm. I think that's basically what it was. I lost it in the chat for a second, but um, ekphrastic poetry, how, how important is it? Do you want to start with that one, Lilo, since you had, okay. you had the, the quadruple uh, ekphrastic poem? Um, am I unmuted? Yes. Um, I love ekfra writing ekphrastic poetry and usually enjoy reading it too. I almost think I have to keep myself from just doing just doing the, doing that uh, to write about a painting. I have quite a few poems about paintings um, and other forms of art. So for me, it's just great fun and um, yeah, very important. I could jump in there if no one else. Uh, just, uh, I, I think a lot about this thing. I think it was Amiri Baraka said once, and I've never been able to find this in writing since, that uh, poetry is a genre of music. And uh, I just, for somehow that's helpful for me, um, sort of dissolving the boundaries there. And I realized you, know, you could, you know, go pretty far 
um, in either direction from music, but, uh, and, and still call it poetry, but, um, yeah. And the sounds matter to me. The sounds matter a lot, even if I'm not, I'm not rhyming. And so I think there's just a resonance with, with, with music, especially for me and, um, you know, great songwriters, um, and the interplay of, of the, you know, whatever it is, the melody and the lyrics is really, is, is inspired, you know, inspiring creatively for me. So it's a little bland, but I do go back to that thing that I think Amiri Barak has said many years ago about music um, or poetry being a genre of music to help explain why I go there so much. But yeah. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. I, I think I came to ekphrastic sort of visual art, ekphrastic poetry as a student of poetry as a young person. And I, and I return to it as a teacher of poetry because I do think it's a great way. It was a great way for me as a student anyway to, to step outside of what I thought of as myself <laughs> uh, and as therefore sort of the, the kind of go-to material for poetry being very sort of autobiographical and confessional. And, and then of course, the more I sort of did it, the more I looked at, at paintings and thought about them and thought about the people in them, if there were people in them or imagined other things about them, it did also become a re you know, engagement with myself. <laughs> like it's, it's um, I think of Mark Doty's book, Still Life with Oysters and Lemon and this idea that the still life is really what you're looking at is not the fruit. You're looking at the looking at of the fruit. <laughs> um, and so I think um, when I think of ekphrasis, I think about both sort of stepping outside of my kind of immediate self, again, whatever that is, and but also finding myself for in a surprising way or a, from a new angle, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. And that poetry does need music. Uh, the musicality in poetry will distinguish it from other genres. Uh, I don't mean that all the poems right now, you still have to have the end rhymes, but uh, at least when you write a poem, you have to read a few times orally to get the feel of the rhythm or excellence that comes in yeah. uh, to make your poem sound you know, more musical. And uh, otherwise uh, the poem will be reading like uh, a prose, a prose. Uh, I think that's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's, here's another um, consideration. Um, last year, I, I did my first chapbook and I, I'm curious um, and this is a question again, since you guys are all chapbook winners, what, what, how did you feel um, in terms of completing the chapbook and in terms of completing your first or second or third full length book? Um, how, how is the challenge different with the chapbook from doing the full length book? Because I think they're both um, equally challenging. I think both of them a struggle to get through. But how do you feel looking at your chapbook and looking at your full length collection? What does the chapbook do for you? Or um, how was how was the, the putting together of a full length collection uh, different for you? How did that work? Oh, I'll jump in. That's an easy one. The full length <laughs> collection didn't have Jennifer and Margot as editors. <laughs> Oh my God, I don't think I, 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 I was so new to poetry with the chapbook um, that I don't think I, re I fully appreciated it. I thought this is what all editors do, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, wrong. Um, so I think I was very spoiled uh, by the chapbook and the beauty of the chapbook mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah, I was spoiled. Mm -hmm. Liz? I, I was a little spoiled too, like the whole experience, the, the editorial sort of, and the, and the reading. Um, this is a little bit off the question, but 
but Margot wrote to me and said, oh, so you'll be coming up to do a reading and we want to know who you want to read with. And mm. I was like, well, like, <laughs> You get to pick. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and I and I wrote back. I think I wrote some dumb email back. Like, are you like anyone? Anyone? And you know, she comes back something like, well, I guess anyone living. I mean, we can ask. You know? <laughs> and I was so blown away by that. And my stu- I shared that with my students that I felt like, oh, I don't know what to do here. I'm so sort of excited and horrified. And some of my students said, well, you should you should ask to read with a really bad poet so you sound really good. <laughs> <laughs> I did not take that advice, but the I think I love the chapbook serving size for poetry so much. I feel like it's a uh, it's a way to cultivate audience a little bit, mm. um, and I don't mean that in sort of a crass way. But I I know that folks bought my chapbook, like my my neighbors and my non poetry friends. Um, it's not too big a commitment. It's not, you know, it's a good, but I also think there's a challenge there. Like sometimes it's, and I'm not a fiction writer, but I teach creative writing. And so I dabble a little and I think of the difference between like hearing novelists talk about how hard it is to write micro fiction, mm. right? Because there's this, or how short sort of standard short story length is so different from yeah. the short story. And just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's easier. And so this idea of like selecting stuff for a chat book Mm. feels more um feels more like a finely a little more finely faceted jewel potentially mm. than a book that feels like it has a little more i don't know like yeah. little breathing room something like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. very good very good yeah 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 the chat book is almost like a single poem in a way right that it has to be honed that you can't afford mis- too many mistakes in there like you, you can get away with stuff in a whole big collection because they say, well, I, I like these 10 poems, you know what I mean? But, but the chapbook, you almost have to be dead on all the time with that, you know? And, and, and I think that what helps is that you have a particular subject that's kind of guiding you or move, keeping you on the rails, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Liz just wrote to us, this was before my time at the center, that her reading was with Cornelius Eady. That mm. must have been great. Oh, wow. Wonderful. What year was that, Liz? It, was, it would have been 2009, I think. Nine, okay. I still can't, I sort of still can't believe it. It seems like maybe it was a dream. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marion was there, she remembers. <laughs> That's so great. And Margot was there and Susanna maybe was there too. Um, but it's so great to have all of you here tonight and to hear your work. And Mervyn, what a wonderful host you have been and um, what great questions you've asked the poets. This was such a wonderful reading. Thank you so much, all of you for being here. Don't forget, um, all, I have links in the chat to their wonderful full-length collections. Please support your SHP pressmates um, and, and get their books. Yeah. And um, it was really wonderful to hear all of you reading together. And like Mervyn said, such unique, different voices all coming together tonight. So it was a real treat to have you here. And we will save the chat um, and send it to all of you. And make sure you write to us um, so Jesse could get your honoraria out to you in the mail. Thank you all for being here. What a great audience. Have a wonderful night. Hope to see all of you next Thank week you. in some capacity at the gala. We would love to have you. Afa Michael Weaver, Melissa Phoebos and Garth Greenwell are the honorees and they'll they'll be we'll hear them reading their work and so thank you all a bunch of poetic names there's this uh, Lilo Wei and there's Liz All, Spree McDonald and Zheng Ching Zeng I think I got that right Zeng. yes you did <laughs>
Great, great. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful week and weekend. See you next you. week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.